I'm the Space Quest historian. Hello. Today I thought we'd uh, take a step into the real world and watch my grubby, filthy human hands caress and fondle some valuable and in some cases downright priceless physical items. Now, you'll have to excuse the fairly amateurish look of this video because as I'll be showing some physical items and talking about them, I had to forego my usual setup where I can just record my voiceover in advance and then use clever editing tricks to cover up my mistakes. My many mistakes. So please bear with me and try to look past these frankly piss poor production values as I take a look at the various physical editions of Space Quest 1, the Zarian Encounter. And also throughout this video I'll try and give you some idea of how rare some of these boxes are and what they might be worth, but please take those appraisals with a grain of salt. I'm not into the whole trading and selling part of the big box collector scene. I just collect big boxes primarily for their sentimental and nostalgic value, of which there is a lot. Oh yes. So anytime you hear me say, oh, this box is worth so and so online, please note that A, those are just the values I looked up on eBay and various other auction sites when I was writing the script, and B, those values do tend to fluctuate as time goes on. So even if some of this dollars and cents stuff is accurate at the time of making this video, it might be, it might not be, it might also very well not be in the future. So. My advice to you, if you are keen on getting some of these Space Quest boxes and collecting them for yourself, or indeed any sort of classic retro big box game, my advice is to seek out people who are much more knowledgeable about this shit online. There are a fair few dedicated communities out there who deal with this kind of stuff, notably on Facebook. There's the Big Box PC Game Collectors and Big Box PC Game Marketplace groups. These are populated by some of the best and brightest minds of that ilk. So yeah, I just wanted to clear up up front, I'm not an authority on the subject when it comes to the value of these items. I'm just here to give you a ballpark indication of what they might be worth, but you're really better off leaving that sort of shit to the professionals. All right. <sighs> What I'm here to talk about today are the many variants and versions of the first game in the Space Quest series. Space Quest 1, The Saren Encounter, first released in 1986 by Sierra Online, as it says down there, and its remake from 1991, colloquially known as Space Quest 1 VGA. Don't worry, we'll get to this bad boy. Now, some of these boxes may look deceptively similar. But I promise you, there are some interesting differences between these, and I'll be going through both the outside of the boxes themselves, as well as the interior, that means all the inserts, the manuals, and the game discs themselves. Although I don't actually have a computer with a floppy drive, so I'm not actually going to put the discs in anything, but uh, you, you get the idea, you, you get to see the discs, I'm sure you're familiar with the games already. And I'll finish off with some of the rarest and juiciest boxes that any serious Space Quest collector would happily stab themselves in the knee with a pair of scissors to own, but don't worry, we'll get to those. Now, let's start with the most box standard version of the original Space Quest 1 game from 1986. This is the most common version you'll see on eBay and various other auction sites these days. A complete... A complete... Why can't I say? Complete in box. Come on. Get it together, man. A complete inbox... Complete inbox? What? A complete in-box copy of this version will typically run you around 150 to 200 American US dollars. Cough at the buckazoids. Uh, on eBay and whatever, although that of course varies depending on the condition of the box and uh, it's something to do with this little sticker down here. Some variants have a, a different kind of sticker, uh, maybe one of these kinds. There are some re-releases of the boxes, who knows. Uh, check Again, check with the professionals, not me. This variant is known as the rocket box because it has, as you can see, a picture of a, uh, a picture of a spaceship on the front, which uh, is presumably the ship Roger buys from Tiny's used spaceships on Corona, and I, I would assume there's a rocket on it somewhere, but anyway, they call it the rocket box. Anyway, the logo on top, uh, the logo you see here at the top of the box is actually a real-life miniature sculpture created by Mark Crow, the game's artist and one half of the two guys from Andromeda, and it was made using bits and pieces of various model kits, which, uh, you know, you movie special effects nerds will know is called kit bashing, and they photographed this from various angles and then used it as the logo on the front of the box. And I know what you're thinking, unfortunately, no, the real-life sculpture here doesn't exist anymore and neither do the photographs that they took of it, so I can't show you the sculpture in any more detail than what you see here. But but it is nice if my ring light wouldn't keep shining in its face. Ooh, look at the halo. Da, da, da. Anyway, if we turn the box over, we find an incredibly busy back cover 
Also, with a halo, like, yeah, I'll cut in some inserts. We see some screenshots over here that show four scenes from the game. And these were photographed off of a CRT monitor because remember, there was no way to take a digital screenshot of your computer in 1986. But they're nice and crisp, save for these slightly bizarre halos around Roger and the bar patrons here at the bottom. Anyway, the text here on the back, I'm just going to put this down. The text here on the back starts off with a rather lame Star Trek catchphrase that uh, I'm sure neither Scott nor Mark had anything to do with, to boldly go where no man has swept the floor. Comedy. And then it goes into this faux captain's log thing that doesn't sound like it was written by a captain at all because it keeps referring to you as in your crew and your ship. So I'm going to have to assume that this captain's log thing was actually written by Roger's subconsciousness or more likely some coked up marketing dude who was seeing double at 4 a.m. But most bizarrely, it refers to the main antagonists, the Sarians, as those nasty, trigger-happy space pirates from the Lower East Side, which makes no sense in the context of the story, and even less sense when you consider that this game wasn't developed in some dingy, roach-infested basement office in Manhattan, but rather in the quiet, scenic mountain town of Oakhurst, California. Mmm, yes. It also promises to be fun and crazy, and out of this world, which I suppose is fairly accurate. And it also promises to be in the tradition of King's Quest, which is only accurate in the technical sense. And actually quite ironic when you consider that the two guys set out to intentionally make this the anti-King's Quest. But hey, I'm not the coked up marketing dude. Yet. Anyway, the features here. That would be these guys. Promises incredible 3D graphics and pop-up text windows that alleviate the apparently common affliction of calluses on your return finger, which I still have to call bullshit on because you still use the return key an awful lot in this game. It also says multiple solutions and variable scoring. Sure, I guess, but there's really only two puzzles in the game that have multiple solutions. You got the Orat puzzle on Corona, where you can either chuck your water bottle at him or lead the spider droid into his cave and watch them get up close and personal. I love that. And there's also the way into the laundry room aboard the Deltor, where you can either push this crate up against the wall, use your Xenon army knife to pry open this vent, crawl through the dingy crawl spaces, kick open this other vent, and tumble ass first into the laundry room, or just climb into the trunk and wait for someone to take you there. Uh, full sentence inputs? Sure, but why would you bother? Because it is faster to just type get rock instead of pick up the rock. And then there's optional joystick control, which I think we should all be glad is optional, since it is much easier to control Roger with the keyboard. Anyway, lastly, you get FREE COUPONS in all caps. This is actually very interesting for reasons I will demonstrate once we open this bad boy up. But to cap everything off, here's a picture of Mark Crow and Scott Murphy, aka the two guys from Andromeda, shown vacationing in front of the mountain that Sierra used as their logo. Now, pay less attention to the babbling about their favorite movies and the optimistic plug for a sequel, and pay more attention to the photo itself, because this will become interesting when we take a look at some of the other variants of this box. That's a guarantee and a promise. Anyway, the idea for dressing up as aliens with mohawks and pig snouts? That was apparently Mark Crow's idea. That's this guy over here. He's also the one who sourced the spiffy Hawaiian shirts, as well as making the mohawked bald caps and prosthetic pig snouts. And the snouts were actually sculpted to fit on the two guys' noses. They're just stuck on there. They're like screwing in a light bulb. And I know this because Scott actually still has his mohawk and prosthetic snout, which I had the equally fantastic and slightly bizarre opportunity to try on for myself. But anyway, disgustingly self-aggrandizing bragging aside, let's slide slide off the slip cover and open up the box and inside the box we find the game on two five and a quarter floppy disks. Hello diskies. They're called floppies because they go like this. Now since this is version 2.2, the last version of the game to come out, Sierra had long since stopped making those fancy artwork things for the disc labels, so they instead just used this generic label with the game title and version number typewritten on it. Yay. You might also find the game on low density three and a half inch disks, but I'm pretty sure these are not the IBM PC disks because these actually came from the Apple IIGS version, which I'll show you in just a minute. And there was also a version of the game that came on a single high density three and a half inch disk, which I can't show you because I don't have one of those. Anyway, underneath them, we find indeed the two coupons that were on the back of the box. Yay. 
These are for the in-game stores that you find on Yulin's Flats, the Bar and the Droids R Us store. And believe it or not, these can actually be used in the game itself. Because even though they don't appear as inventory items in the game, you can rock up to the bartender and type show coupon, which gets you five buckasoids and a free beer on the house. And similarly, you can also show coupon to the sales alien in the Droids R Us store to get a discount when you purchase the navigation droid. Now, this isn't mentioned anywhere in the game. You just have to infer it from the fact that there are two physical copies of these coupons inside your box. And this one actually says droids be us and not droids are us because they had to change that for semi-legal reasons in later versions of the game. Next up, we have the manual, which contains all your standard information about how to get the game running and also a surprisingly detailed backstory for the game, which more or less just reiterates what the game already tells you in the opening text crawl during the game's introduction, but it also very helpfully tells you how to pronounce stuff like the Arcada and Roger's home planet Xenon. Anyway, the rest isn't that interesting. It's just a bunch of stuff. You're supposed to draw a map and here's a very sketchy little map that someone drew in ballpoint pen, I'm sure. Under this, we have a reference card. Ba -ba -da -da. And this folds out and tells you very simple things like how to move Roger across the screen and what a text parser actually does and uh, stuff that's also explained in broad terms inside the game manual. But here it's uh, specific to whatever home computer system you bought the game for. In this case, it's the IBM PC version. And after that, we have an order form for an official Space Quest hint book. <laughs> I guess this anticipated that the players would be beating their heads against the desk for months and trying to figure out why they can't deactivate the lasers in the underground caverns on Corona because they missed picking up an invisible shard of glass or something like that. Now, if you filled this out and sent it off, you would receive this inauspicious looking little tome, which actually came with a highlighter pen. Now, I have two of these hint books that I can show you, but I can't show the actual highlighter pen because I don't have one of those and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't work. But you didn't need a highlighter pen in order to actually read the contents of the hint book because you needed to sort of, uh, you know, scrape the highlighter pen across these little boxes wherein the hint is contained. Because all the hints here were actually written in this sort of disappearing ink type stuff that would only reveal itself if you painted over the page. And unfortunately, while the highlighter color itself remains on the page, let me see if I can find one. Yeah, there it is. The ink itself that was below it has completely faded away over time. So whatever answers lie in this hint book are unfortunately destined to remain a secret forever. Anyway, putting those aside, after the hint book ordering form, we have a registration card. Please retain this card. Oh, oh, camera's over there. Please retain this card. This wasn't the sort of registration we're used to today where you have to register software in order to be able to use it. This game worked just fine if you didn't send this in. This was just Sierra's way of doing marketing research and finding out how many people were playing on different various home computer systems of the time. So you're supposed to like check off your machine type here. Are you playing on an Apple II? If so, you're being weird. Uh, at least the, the 2C, holy crap, that thing runs like absolute turd and ass. Magintosh Tandy, Apple 2GS, Atari ST, Apple compatible, if you have no idea what the fuck kind of Apple you have, Amiga, IBM PC or PC Junior, or IBM compatible, where'd you buy it, what's your age, uh, how did you hear about Sierra software, and whatever comments you might have, you might, you know, just... I think I'll just put bollocks. And lastly, in this box, we have an advertisement leaf... Advertisement? And lastly, in this box, we have an advertisement leaflet for Sierra's BBS, which some of my more age-advanced demographic might remember as the precursor to the internet we know and love today. Essentially, you connect your landline phone up to a modem and use that to dial up to the phone number on this card. Where is... there it is. Bop, bop, bop. And then you'd be able to download patches and game demos just like you would from a modern website, except painfully slowly since, you know, this was the 1980s. Anyway, there's plenty of videos about the Wild West days of BBSs on YouTube if you want to know more about how this shit worked. I'm not that person. Let's now take a look at some of the different variants of the Space Quest 1 box. Now, I won't be showing you the contents of these other boxes uh, because they're pretty much identical to the one we've just looked at, but these do have some fairly interesting differences on the front and back cover. So I'm just going to gingerly and very gently, hopefully, put all this stuff back in this box. 
Shroop. Off you scoot. Now, this one pff, said that in a weird way. Now, this one may at first glance resemble the box we just took a look at with the sweet ring light halo on it. But the keen observer will have spotted a substantial difference. This screen is known as the screenshot box because it has a screenshot on it. This was an early release of the game and although this does crop up on auction sites fairly regularly, they also do tend to command a fairly high price. These go for about 150, 200 bucks. I have seen some demand upwards of $300 for ones in pristine condition. And there's actually a sub variant of this box that is pretty rare and even more expensive because the first run of these screenshot boxes had a misprint on the back of the box where the photo of the two guys is mirrored. So as you can see on this one, Mark is on the left. That's the regular box. But on this one, Scott is on the left. And if you get one of these copies with the mirrored misprint, on the back, that is easily going to set you back around 350, maybe 400 bucks. Yay. Now, before I move on to the rarest and juiciest of Space Quest 1 boxes, I just quickly want to show you the boxes of the, of the remake of Space Quest 1 that came out in 1991. This is commonly known as Space Quest 1 VGA, and I'm turning it the wrong way. The camera is... Uh, how do you do this, Mom? I don't know how to video. Now, I've got another video coming up where I'll dive deeper into the history of this somewhat ill-advised and some might even say controversial version. So I'm not going to spend too much time, or frankly, any time really, elucidating on that for the moment. But I just want to show you a couple of variants of these boxes because <laughs> a couple of them are frankly quite hilarious. This here is the standard. VGA remake box. It's a very thin box, as you can see. It's not like the big chunky ones that uh, with the slip covers that Sierra more commonly put out at the time, like the King's Quest V box and the Space Quest IV box. This is a thin little bastard. And inside, you will find the game on five. Trust me, there are five. One, two, three, four, five. See, I just pissed off all the big box collectors by chucking the box. Okay, five. Floppy disk, three and a half inch floppy disk, and a fairly trim manual that just basically gives you the basic overview of the story. This is copy and pasted directly from the EGA version's manual. And some copy protection information. There we go. Mm-hmm. Copy protection, yes. You need to use this to complete the game, and someone's already uh, checked off a couple of the codes here. I didn't do that. Whoever sold me this box did. And in the back, you've also got a little walk through. This is how you click on, on, on stuff. This is how you do stuff. And anyway, and here's a, <laughs> here's a plug for the official guide to Roger Wilcombe, which just sounds weird. Anyway, this is the, uh, uh, not the Space Quest Companion, but a different book of walkthroughs that uh, Jill Champion and Richard C. Leinecker wrote. This is not the real cover though. As you can see, this is just a drawing, like a mock-up of it. Now, Speaking of hint books, I also have the hint book for this game. Um, eh, extreme close up. This dispensed with the whole disappearing ink trick from the first one because I guess they realized that, you know, <laughs> the ink didn't really work after a fair amount of time. So this has the more standard sort of hidden message type affair where you have to put this adventure window in front of the little boxes, little red boxes here. Uh, this will reveal the hints if you squint really, really hard. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, probably not. Uh, okay, well, you take my word for it. There's text behind it. You can, you can kind of see it. This hint book also has a couple of cool illustrations and sketches from the game. Let me see if I can find one of those. Ah, oh, there's Roger. And over here in the back, there's a Sarian and a Caronian underground dude. And this is actually pretty cool because, unfortunately, when Sierra was bought out by this revolving door of other companies in the late 90s, all the material that was used in development of all the Sierra games was actually thrown in a trash heap. It was never recovered. And that includes all the artwork. So these are the only remaining glimpses into the development process of Space Quest 1 VGA that we have today, which is, I guess... Kind of sad or kind of lucky, depending on your disposition. Anyway, after this, we have a bunch of other weird inserts. Win $50,000 for your college from Sierra. Sure, why not? And 
Then there's an, uh, a sort of generic game manual uh, this just outlines how you know the icons work and all that sort of stuff and this uh, manual was just reprinted wholesale for every VGA game, every point-and-click game that Sierra put out. And the last thing in this box is another plug for a hint book. Alright, let's get all this shit back in the box again. In you go, Sonny Jim. Oh hey, let's let's piss off the big box collectors again. Uh, hup, hup. Ooh. There you go. Right. So that's the VGA version, as you can see. VGA. Now eagle-eyed people who like to freeze frame videos have probably noticed that this one is a little bit different. It may look identical to this one, but that is actually the 16 color EGA remake of the first game. Yeah, because not only did Sierra remake the game in VGA, they also released a separate version where all the 256 color graphics were downgraded to 16 colors. And this was actually standard practice for Sierra at the time. Uh, games like Space Quest 4 and King's Quest 5 also had 16 color versions that were sold separately. Um, uh, for some reason, here, take a look at this. Remember that the, uh, the other game came on, uh, on 5 disc? Now, for some fucking ass backwards reason, the EGA version comes on 6 discs instead of 5. I have no idea why, but yeah, okay. <laughs> and also, I, I swear these are original discs, but you know, the, the, the colors of the discs are... I've, I've I got a couple of blue ones, and I uh, got a white one, and I got two that were in a tanning bed for some reason. I have no idea why, but whoop, in you go. But if you're in for something truly perplexing... Perplexing. Your best. Try that again. But if you want something truly perplexing, have a look at... This. Now, this looks to the unobservant as the standard rocket box of the 1986 original, but it is actually the first run of the 1991 remake. And the only way you can tell is because there's a little translucent sticker down here that says 256 color version. Because apart from that little sticker, this box is exactly the same as the rocket box variant from 1986. The back of the box even has the screenshots from the 1986 version, even though the discs inside, and I swear this is true, contain the 1991 remake. And the story goes that Sierra was actually in such a hurry to get this remake out to stores that they didn't bother waiting for the other boxes to be printed up, so they just grabbed some of the old boxes and just shoved the game in there and slapped the sticker on them and whoosh, sent them off to the shops. And I'm not sure where that falls in terms of savvy marketing stunts, but I, I don't think it ranks up there with the most successful ones. Now, prices for these guys tend to vary quite widely because some sellers on eBay will try to delude you into thinking that these are rare just because they come in a box. Uh, I've seen some sellers demand upwards of $150 for a copy, but you can also find copies at around half price for like 60 bucks, 70 bucks maybe, I don't know. Um, there were also copies of this remake that shipped on five and a quarter floppy disks, and those tend to be a little bit rarer than the three and a half disk variant that I have here. Um, and the 16 color CG, fuck, the what? The CGA, God, I wish. And the 16 color EGA version and the 1986 box cover version with the fucking sticker on it. These are also a little harder to come by, but I wouldn't go so far as to call these rare. In fact, these are the most common versions of the Space Quest 1 you'll find on auction sites. Apparently a lot of people want to get rid of it for some reason. In my opinion, if you pay more than 100 bucks for any one of these, you're probably getting stiffed. But again, check with the professionals. Now, the remake also came out on CD-ROM, released by a budget label called Kix. And I have that in a truly disfigured, mangled form, but uh, I just... Oh, I should probably go and get that. Ah! Now, let's try that again. The remake also came out on CD-ROM, released by the budget label Kix, K-I-X-X, which I have here in a truly disfigured and mangled form. Now, I'm only showing you this because if you're under the impression that because it comes on a CD, a little shiny thing like this, uh, that it might contain a fully voiced talkie edition of Space Quest 1, you are in for a disappointment. This CD just contains the regular floppy disk version, and the rest of the CD is filled up with demos of other games released under the K-I-X-X or Kix label which also amusingly includes a large selection of games from Sierra's primary competitor at the time, uh, LucasArts. Yeah, this thing is chock full of demos. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Enough of that. Let's move on. Let's move back in time, in fact, and finally get to the... Ri Pfft. You can fuck off as well. 
Let's get to the really juicy ones. These are, as Boris Balkan in the Ninth Gate would say, the rarest and choicest editions. I have no idea what choicest is. Uh, is that really the way you say that? Choicest? Choiciest? I don't fucking know. Although the misprint boxes of the screenshot box are pretty rare to come by and they tend to fetch frankly absurd digits on eBay, there is nothing that beats the holy grail. This is the first run edition, also known as the black box, and for some reason I'm just scooting it all over the table here. Could you go over here please? I don't want to ruin the surprise of the bottom one, so I'm just gonna put the other boxes over here. You didn't see anything! Right, these were the first releases of the game, and depending on what condition you find it in and how much of the contents inside are still intact, these can easily go for up to $600 or $700 on eBay, and the... I'm so nervous holding this thing, I'm fucking up the script. These can easily go for up to like $600 or $700 on eBay. The very first run of these boxes has this grit pattern. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, for once the fucking ring light comes in handy. There's a little grit pattern here, uh, which is reflected in the light. And the second release of this box didn't have the grit. Uh, but regardless of whether you get a grid or a non-grit version of these, these are still quite pricey. The box itself here is a gatefold where the front of the box here opens up. For some reason I grunted like it was a massive effort. Anyway, the, uh, the gatefold here opens up to reveal a frankly lavish inner cover that contains even more screenshots and uh, some more blurbs about what to expect if you actually go out and buy the game. And the uh, back of the box contains uh, three different screenshots and a slightly larger picture of the two guys from Andromeda, which is not mirrored, uh, and a slightly less verbose back blurb. Um, it's, it's, it's a very, very nice box, I think. Anyway, this black box variant is considered the holy grail for Space Quest collectors, and for very good reason, because it is, frankly, quite nice looking. And for many years, I thought I'd never own one of these myself, and I was always jealous of all my friends who had one. All my friends. Everyone had one. Until an extremely kind soul actually donated one to me. And I even did this very poorly lit and very amateurish unboxing video in my car when I received it like late at night because I was so excited to get one and this does indeed remain one of my most treasured possessions. One thing I kind of want to see because it's got this little plastic into it, I kind of want to see if the coupons inside are... Yes! This one is Droids R Us. Woohoo! Okay. Yeah. Put this aside for a bit because this is where I get into some fairly shameful and quite terribly arrogant bragging territory. So if you don't like that sort of thing, you might want to stop the video here. So I apologize in advance. Since receiving this coveted and highly sought after black box, I have had the incredible good fortune to acquire not one, but two other black box copies. Uh, both of these were given to me personally by Scott Murphy himself, so they are, as you can imagine, the sort of things I gladly run headfirst into a burning building to rescue. This first one was a flat box that Scott had swiped off of the production line from the very first run, and as you can see, he even signed it for me. Thank you. Uh, I got this when I went to PAX West for the first time in 2019, and I got to spend a day hanging out with Scott at his house in Seattle, along with a small handful of friends. You might recognize one of them, I think. He has a moderately successful YouTube channel of his own. I don't know. Anyway, that day remains, and I'm not kidding, one of the fondest memories of my life and it really was one of those yeah I can't believe this is happening kind of days but anyway for the box itself now as Scott told us apparently it was common practice in those days for Sierra designers when they just finished making a game to pay a visit to the printers and steal one of the copies of the game boxes off the assembly line before they were unfolded and you know all the shit got put inside with game discs and inserts and stuff so when I got this it was literally just the flat box completely flat nothing inside I have since actually I'm gonna pick it up again I have since unflattened it as you can see put it together and I've attempted to find some of the contents that would go inside it but it doesn't have the plastic tray thing these are uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks of the first version at least I, I'm pretty sure it's the first version it's version 1.0 X so I think that's the first version that came out in the boxes and so these disks do contain version 1.0x. This box has been stored since 1986 in its pristine hot off the factory flat state, so this is in, uh, dare I say it, fairly impeccable condition. Kind of minor scuffs around the opening here, I swear I didn't do that, but uh, a little scuff down here, but yeah, this is in a pretty, pretty good condition, really. 
Now, the one that was donated to me a couple of years ago is not in any bad condition by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you see the top bit here? Yeah, this thing doesn't really want to close in all the way, and that's actually not because the box is broken or anything. Uh, it's because this stupid plastic tray here is actually, you know, it's, it's very brittle, first of all, and as you can see, it's got this stupid little flap on top, and this flap actually pushes against the top of the lid. So over the years, this will keep pushing and pushing and pushing until the flap doesn't really want to stay closed anymore. Now, when I got this flat box with the signature on it, as I'm sure you can imagine, I honestly thought that, you know, my collection of Space Quest boxes is not going to get any better. This is, this is the pinnacle. Uh, not only do I now have two black boxes, but one of them has a personal signature on it, and it's a personal copy from the designer himself, so fucking hell, man. So, as you can probably imagine, my head came pretty close to physically exploding off the top of my head in sheer unbridled joy when I went back to Seattle the following year. It wasn't the following year, it was in 2022. Seriously, this man has no sense of chronology. Stop encouraging him. It's only going to get worse. And then went to see Scott for a second time, this time entirely on my own. I hung out at his house, I sat in his comfy chair, I tried on his original mohawk ball cap and his Andromeda nose, which kept falling off my face because obviously it wasn't made to fit me, but I did manage to snap a couple of good selfies in the short span of time before it eventually fell off my face. Had a few beers, chatted with my hero about everything and nothing for a whole day, and at one point we even ordered pizza, and when it arrived he said something that will stick in my head forever. I sat there in his comfy chair with a beer in one hand and a slice of pepperoni pizza in the other one, and he looked at me with a sly smile on his face and just said, this is what game development tastes like. Anyway, as I was getting ready to leave, he did that thing you usually only see on TV shows where, you know, where a character says, hold on, I almost forgot, and he disappeared off into another room in the house, and when he came back, he handed me this box. Now, as you can see, it is a black box and it's still in its factory shrink wrap. Now, black boxes here already go for pretty astronomical buckasoids on eBay, but finding one that's still sealed in its original shrink wrap is practically impossible. Uh, and they do go, if, if one does crop up, they do go for like completely insane amounts of money. So I knew he was handing me something that was just to, you know, any Space Quest collector or even a big box collector, uh, obscenely rare. Just obscenely rare and valuable. Um, and a, a series of poorly strung together words, like the ones I'm reading right now, <laughs> tumbled out of my mouth and tried to convey that he'd already given me one of the most awesome gifts of any time, and I couldn't possibly accept this, but he insisted and said, no, 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 dude, this one, this one is really special. And he catches the light beautifully, I think you'll agree. So I thought he meant it was because of, you know, the shrink wrap. So it's, you know, a completely sealed copy. So I thought, yay, hey, thank you, thank you so much. And, and then I went home, cloud nine, and I finished off the rest of my beers on the ferry back. And I thought, yeah, life can't possibly get any better than this. And it wasn't actually until I got all the way back to my home in Denmark and predictably started posting photos of this fucking thing to childishly envy my fellow Space Quest nerds that Scott replied to one of the tweets and told me why it was so special. Uh, apparently he'd already told me this when he was giving me the box at his house, but in my frantic attempts to make the words coming out of my mouth make even the slightest bit of sense, I had failed to pick up on what he was actually saying. This isn't just a sealed Space Quest 1 black box, although that is pretty cool. It is, in fact, the very first black box that ever rolled off the assembly line. This is, and I, sh I shit you not, this is quite literally the first ever Space Quest game, ever. So it was left on Scott's desk when he worked at Sierra all the way back in 1986 by the office manager at Sierra at the time, and this yellow post-it that you've probably been wondering about this entire time is in that office manager's handwriting. It says, Scott first one from Cindy. Uh, I'm not sure what the last bit is. So, uh, frankly, I have no idea what the fuck this thing is doing in my house, on my table, or on my shelf, or anyway, I, I don't know. Frankly, this thing belongs in a museum somewhere behind bulletproof glass, if you ask me, but here it is, in my hands, and by God, you better believe these hands will be cold and dead before this thing winds up anywhere else, so, uh, yeah.
you'd like to see me take a look at the boxes of the other games in the series or the different collections and anthology editions that came out over the years while Sierra were still doing business, let me know in the comments. I do have some very interesting variants of some of the other games in the series, though, <laughs> I gotta be honest, I don't think I can top the story of owning the first ever copy of Space Quest 1, but yeah, okay, I'll stop now, I promise. I've also accumulated a fairly sizable assortment of Space Quest related trinkets and physical goodies, both official and unofficial, including like figurines and posters and of course the soundtrack albums we put on on vinyl a couple of years ago and you know some pins and stuff like that. So if you want to see me go over those, leave a comment down below. And until next time, I'm going to go put this away somewhere safe and maybe put this together. Anyway, until next time, we'll see you around the Chrono stream. Bye.